لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولله الحمد والله أكبر على ما هدانا الله أكبر على ما رزقنا من بحيمة الأنعام والحمد لله على ما أبلانا سبحان الله الذي ابتلى البرايا بأنواع البلايا لألا يبتل الجزاء وليحسن العطايا فبعث الرسول ونسبا خداة خير السبل ضعيفة الحالات قوية في عزائم النيات ولو شاء لجعلهم أولي قوة شديدة فظلت الأعناق لهم خاضعين وخفضت لهم أجنهة المستكبرين الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون والحمد لله على رسول المسدد المحمود الأحمد بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us another opportunity to gather together to remember him and to celebrate Eid al-Adha, the Eid of sacrifice. Let us not forget those of our friends, relatives, mu'mineen, muslimin all over the world who were with us in previous years and are no longer with us anymore. May Allah grant them all maghfira in a place amongst the masumin alayhi salam. May I request a surah fatiha for all our marhumin al-fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When we go through life, we need to be very clear about the end goal of whatever we do. A businessman goes into business with the end goal of making a profit. A, sp a sports person goes into a tournament with the end goal of winning that tournament. A person in social services goes into that with the end goal of trying to make a difference. And likewise, you can think of many, many examples like that. As Muslims and as believers, the end goal of our life is to gain the Akhirah and Allah's pleasure. We must not lose sight of the fact that that is our end goal. This life in this world, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, about so, is a means towards an end. This is not an end in itself. Akhirah is what we are aiming for. And as we go through this process in life, one of the steps that we are required to do is to go for Hajj, which has become wajib. The Hujjaj, just to, to recap, when they go for Hajj, what is it that they do? For those that have gone for Hajj, you will remember, it will refresh your memories. And for those that have not gone, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you the opportunity as soon as possible to go for Hajj. When they go for Hajj, these are the rituals that they perform, for example. Where they wear the Ahram, they recite the Talbiyah, they do the tawaf, they pray two rakat namaz a tawaf, they do the sa'i, they do the taqseer, right? And then they spend the day in Arafah, then they go towards Muzdalifa to collect pebbles, and then they arrive in Mina where they stone the pillars on the first day, seven, uh, the seven pebbles on the biggest one, then the next day 21 on all three, and the third day or 23, and then they do the qurbani. These are the rituals that they perform. In the story of Hajj, which you are all aware of and I don't wish to repeat, there are four principal characters. Ibrahim alayhi salam, Hajra alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, and Shaitan. These are the four characters in the story of Hajj. And all the actions of Hajj represent the action of Ibrahim, Hajra, and Ismail alayhi salam, and their struggle against Shaitan. If you look at the analyze it, this is what it is all about. The three main things amongst other things in the story of Ibrahim is his ikhlas, his sincerity, 
his taslim, his submission to Allah's commands, and his tawakkul, his total trust in him. Three words that we need to be aware of, ikhlas, sincerity, taslim, to submit to Allah's commands, and tawakkul, to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with no ifs and buts. In our lives, these are the three characteristics that we need to adopt. Ikhlas, taslim, and tawakkul as we journey towards the akhirah. For the few minutes that we are together today, just want to try and see how we can relate the rituals of Hajj to us who have not gone for Hajj. For example, we just go through a few of them just to get an idea. The Hujjaj wear Ihram. What is Ihram? Two pieces of cloth which reminds them of the day they will pass and they have to be put on a coffin. It should also remind us that at the end when we go, we are muhtaj on the rest of the mu'minin. When I die, I am muhtaj on all of you. It doesn't matter if I am a billionaire. I'm still relying on you now to make sure that you give me a wash, give me the ghusl, give me the two pieces of cloth and bury me. Right? It doesn't matter. It's very, very important. That's it. So that reminds us also. Then they recite the talbiyah. What do they say in the talbiyah? Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika laka labbaik. Here I am, O Allah, at your command. Here I am. You are without associates. Yours are the praise and the grace and the dominion. You are without associates. Here I am. Every time I stand for salat, I can use the example of talbiyah to focus my attention on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he is the one and the only one. He is the center of my life. I rotate around his actions. Just as we say in Surah Fatiha, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Only you do we worship and only from you we seek help. This reminds us of this one. Then we do the tawaf. For those... For the tawaf is essentially going seven times round the Kaaba in an anti-clockwise position. It is not a clockwise position. It is an anti-clockwise position. What is the philosophy of going anti-clockwise? One of the reasons is the world can go away this way. But if Allah's requirement is that I move in a certain way, then even if it means swimming against the tide, I will go against. I will go with what Allah expects of me. So this is one of the philosophies of going anti-clockwise. I am putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the center of my existence. I want to make sure that my whole life revolves around Allah's commandments. I do taslim, I surrender with no ifs and buts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the, one of the philosophies of that. Then we have sa'i. Sa'i is what? Running between Safa and Marwa seven times. Right? This reminds us. Uh, of the struggle of my life. Every day I have to go through different, different struggles. Each one goes through a different struggle. This reminds us of all that. That is why when we go and when we go through these struggles, we say in Surah Fatiha, Ehdina Surat al Mustaqim, right? That keep us on the right path. Let us not stray away from that path. Keep us on the path that you have chosen. This struggle of Sa'i also reminds us of the struggles of our parents especially our mother to raise us and to bring us to this level, right? To become good human beings, to become good Muslims and so on. And that is why this reminds us when we do think of the Sa'i, it should remind us and remember uh, to, to, to say a dua for them in Qunut. What do we say? رَبَّنَا غَفِرْلِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَكُومُ الْحِسَابِ O oh Allah, forgive us. وَلِوَالِدَيَّ and our parents. وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ and the mu'minin. يَوْمَ يَكُومُ الْحِسَابِ Right? On the day of judgment. رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرَ And have mercy upon them just as they had mercy upon me when I was young. Right? All of you have... If for those of you who have seen around you, you have seen little children, right, that are born, that are totally helpless, that are totally reliant upon the parents, especially the mother to ensure that they are taken care of. And this is our time now when the parents age and we pray for them out there. Then it comes to the idea of stoning of the Jamarat. That reminds me of the time that, that Allah has warned me so many times that shaitan is my avowed enemy. 
that I have to struggle against shaitan. Alam in Surah Yasin, what do we say? Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani adama an la ta'budu shaitan innahu lakum aduvum mubeen wa ani abuduni hadha siratum mustaqim. O children of Adam, did I not take a promise from you that you shall not worship shaitan? He is your avowed enemy. He will spare no stone unturned to ensure that you are destroyed. Don't have any short uh, thought processes that shaitan may be f leave you alone. No, 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 no. Shaitan is after Bani Adam. All of us, all of us. From the day Adam came all the way till the last days. He will try and make sure we move away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the stoning of the pillars, in the, when we stone the pillars, the, the, the idea is, the message is to struggle against our inner nafs, our nafs amara that tells us, do this, it's okay, it is okay, you know, constantly, right? And then the nafs lavama is the one that comes and says, no, no, this is not right, right? So if we do not let the nafs lavama take over, then the nafs amara will take over and we will do whatever we want, whatever our heart desires, and that's when we are looking for trouble. And that is where we seek, when we struggle in the matter of life, we have to seek Allah's help and have tawakkul, trust in Allah that Allah will deliver us. As human beings, we are blessed. We as Muslims are even more blessed. And as mu'mineen, we have abundant blessings. Where do we start counting the blessings? Where do we start counting the blessings? The biggest blessing that we have is the blessing of iman, of belief and of faith. Never fall short. This it reminds me of that story of uh, somebody who came to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. You may have heard this, but just to get the point across. Where he comes and says, Mawla, I'm poor. He says, Mawla says, you are not. He says, Mawla, I'm poor. He says, you are not. He says, but Mawla, I'm telling you I'm poor. He says, no, you are not. He says, Mawla, what are you trying to tell me? He says, don't say you are poor. If Allah gives you the wealth of Sulaiman, if Allah gives you the wealth of the worlds that Sulaiman had and the power of Sulaiman, and the condition is you give up your Iman, would you do that? He says, no, absolutely not. Then he says, why are you saying you are poor? Say, I am needy. I have hajat now. Right? We all are. Say, I have hajat. Don't say I am poor. Right? When you have Iman, you are rich. You are rich. You have everything. There are people out there who have billions have no iman whatsoever. Right? We have iman. Hang on to that iman. Don't lose that iman. That is why it is recommended. We say in the Quran also says, Rabbana la tuzikulubana ba'da id hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahhab. O our sustainer, let not our hearts swerve from the truth after you have guided us. We have iman. Now pray to Allah that this iman is intact. And that it builds upon that, that we do not lose it. And you bestow upon the gift of your grace. Verily, you are the giver of, uh, you are the true giver of gifts. Are we thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is what we need to be asked. Do we take these blessings as granted and as our divine right? Or are we acknowledging that really whatever I have is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The ability to speak to you, the ability for you to listen to me, the ability for you to concentrate, and much more. Can you imagine for a moment if you did not have something called memory? If you did not have something called memory or your memory was gone, what would happen? You cannot remember. I would not know what sentence to say next. When I'm saying uh, Alhamd, uh, Surah Fatiha in namaz or so, in the next ayat I would not remember. So these are blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have, uh, that we need to be aware of. Are we thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is the question that we need to ask ourselves. It is within our fitrah. Allah has ingrained within us to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Observe a dog. Observe a dog. When the master treats him well, he will cuddle up, lick the master, and protect him from all danger. Right? Any animal that you treat well, they will come and look after you. They will smell you. They will come and lick you. And whatever the ability of that animal is. And similar examples that I'm sure you are aware of. What I'm saying today, I'm saying first to myself and then to you. One of the ways to 
sub, be thankful is to submit yourself and myself, humble ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah ask us to submit ourselves through him, through the medium of salat or namaz. But what does salat mean to me? Do I have ahsas? Do I have that understanding that salat is important? Not only that, see there is intellectual understanding and there is the heart understanding. Sometimes we have intellectually, we know the heart has not accepted as yet. Only when the mind and the heart accept, that's when there is going to be movement. Huh? Only when both accept, that's when there is going to be movement. What does salat mean to me? It could mean it's boring. It is a chore. It's an, it's an exercise that I go through, stand, go down, go down, stand up, finish it, and say, Alhamdulillah, I'm done. Or it is something, it is a habit that I go through. If I don't do it, I don't feel good. I will pray when I need him. I don't need to pray, and so on and so forth. All these examples. Or does it mean it is my way of saying, thank you, Allah, for the countless blessings that you have granted upon me and are constantly granting upon me? Or is it a way of sneaking up to your beloved five times a day? Right? Just imagine the example of a young man in love. Right? When you are engaged, for those of us who, and for those young ones, you can remember, right? When you are in love, you want to be close to the one you love all the time. You are on WhatsApp, even if it's three o'clock in the morning, right? You are on WhatsApp, you are on test Facebook, you are in Instagram, God knows what else is out there. Anyway, whatever is out there, yeah? Whatever way you communicate out there, you are there in, the, in touch with the loved one you love. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's only asking us to come five times a day. Five times a day only he's asking. But be aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the importance of salat. He does not talk about praying. He talks about establishing. salat. He says establish prayer. What does establish prayer mean? It means not only pray, but pray on time. Pray and pray on time. Not only pray on time, encourage others to also pray. And join you for prayer. Very, very important. salata wa atu zakata wa raqiin and be steadfast in prayer. Practice regular charity and bow down your heads with those who bow down. Rabbijal Mukima Salati wa Mindurriyati Rabbana wa Takabbal Dua. This is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Oh my Lord, make me one who establishes regular prayer and also raise such amongst my offspring, O oh our Lord, and accept you my prayer. So the prayer is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, as evidenced by the Quran, is not only for himself, but he's asking that within his progeny that they also become Musalli. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. If you do not see him, he does see you. Yeah? And Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He's quoting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, When a believer servant stands for the salat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at him until he finishes. And mercy shadows over his head and angels surround him from all sides up to the horizon of the heaven. And Allah assigns an angel to stand at his head saying, O Musalli, O one who is praying, if you knew who is looking at you and to whom you are supplicating, you will look to nowhere, nor will you leave your position. If only we heard the angel telling us that look who you are praying to, you would not move out from there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and the barakat to make sure that we maintain our salat, that we not only pray, but we pray on time, and that we encourage others to pray, and that we make sure that our lives revolve around Allah's commandments, not that Allah is something that is parked on the side and I only pull him up when I need him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal Asr in al Insana lafi Khosr. Illa Ladina Aman wa Amilu Salihati Watawa so bil Haq Watawa so bis Sabr. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Hamdan Kathira. Alhamdulillah, Hiladi Hadana Lihada, Wama Kunna Lina Tadia Lola and Hadan Allah. Lakadja at Rusul Rabbina Bilhak, 
والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد The underlying theme of this Eid is sacrifice. We have been sent into this world for a short period of time. And we have to plow this earth so that we can gain the Akhirah. Will we follow Allah's commandments and stay away from the shaitan? Or will we regret on the day of Qiyamah? The choices are very clear and there is no question of any gray area here. We live in a very turbulent world. And the lives of the Muslims is getting more and more difficult and from what is happening around us. It seems pretty evident that things will only get worse before they get better. We will be tested like we have never been before. And in these situations, we have to think hard and fast as to what will be our saving grace. Will we compromise our Iman and our faith for world safety and or gain or business or whatever? Or will we hold on regardless of what happens? This will depend on the state and the level of our Iman. In about 20 days or so, we will all be revisiting the tragedy of Karbala. Let us look at our situation and see the situation of Imam Hussein salam that he found himself in. What would we do if we were in his position? That is the question. If everything else I say you forget, ask yourself this question. And think about this on an ongoing basis. What would you and I have done if we were in the situation of Imam Hussein alayhi salam? That is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Will we take the easy way and compromise or, we be, or we will not back down on what we believe in? Marum Mullah Askar mentioned a couple of very interesting examples during those days when he was in prison, in Saddam's prison. He says, he talks about this one man who constantly used to say, Ya laytani kuntu ma'akum fa'afuza fawzan azima. Right? We say in Ziyarat, I wish I were with you, O Imam Hussein, that I would have gained success as you have gained success. And the Ashab and everybody, right? Ya laytani kuntu ma'akum fa'afuza fawzan azima. He says he went to sleep and he sees himself on the day of Ashura. He sees himself in the day of Ashura and now everybody is gone. All Ashab, Ansar, everybody is gone. It is him and Imam Hussein salam left now. Nobody else. Everybody is gone. Imam turns to him and says, Taqaddam Shia Shaykh. Taqaddam. Proceed. He looks around. He says, no, neither Akbar is here, no Habib is here, no Asghar is here, no Abbas is here, nobody is here, everybody is gone. So only death is facing me, right? Nobody is there, so he says, but Mawla, I don't have a horse. Mawla says, here is my Zulfiqar, take it. Uh, here is my Zuljana, take it. He says, Mawla, I don't have a sword. Imam takes out his sword and says, here is my Zulfiqar, take it. Now there is no escape, huh? The horse is given. Imam gives his. So Imam helps him get on the horse. He's there. He's now on the horse. He has Imam Zuljana and he has Zulfiqar. What more do you want? And he says, Mawla says, Taqaddam. Now he's looking at the masses of warriors all around there waiting to kill him. And he sees a small gap in between. And he turns Zuljana to that gap and he escapes. And he escapes. At that time he says, he wakes up. And he says, what a bad bakht insan I am. Yeah? What a horrible human being I am. That I ran away. Not only that, that I ran away. But I took the horse and the, zuljana, the, the zulfiqar of my imam also. Is that what we find ourselves in? Is that what we will find ourselves in? Right? And the other one is, Mullah says that there was somebody with him in prison also was a mu'min. He had been, this is 1980s, uh, we are talking of early 80, 79, 80. 
And he says this man had been for ziyarat about 16 times those days. It was not that easy to go in those earlier days. And not only that, he says that that man knew the ziyarat by heart. He knew the idhna dukhul by heart. He knew everything by heart. So he stands up and uh, he would recite all this by heart. Three days in the prison, now he starts questioning and he says, really? I've been coming here, I am a follower, I am a, uh, I take care, uh, you know, uh, I love my imam and so on, and my imam has not come to even help me. Three days in prison and I cannot bear all this and so on and so forth. And he starts questioning the wilaya of the imam. And he says, what point is all this? What is this idea of Hazrat Abbas? And what is this idea of Imam Hussein? And why do we ask? And all these questions that start coming. He falls asleep and Imam comes to him and says, Oh, Sheikh, three days of a little trouble in prison and you can't bear it. I gave up everything that I had. I gave away my Abbas. I gave away my Asghar. I gave away my Al Qasim. I gave away Akbar. I gave up everything to protect Islam and to make sure you remain on the path. You couldn't even bear a little bit. You couldn't bear a little bit of difficulties. So these are the questions that we really need to ask ourselves. Will we be on the right path or will we deviate? That is the question that we have. And we need to start struggling within ourselves. It will not be popular. It will not be popular to go the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will not be popular. You will lose friends. As you rise higher, it becomes lonelier. When we are all together, we are all nice and comfortable. But as you rise higher and higher and higher and get closer, it becomes lonelier and lonelier and lonelier out there. You will be a very few. The people will desert you. Imam Hussein left Medina and by the, with, with a huge number of people. By the time he arrived on the day of Ashura, how many were there? 72 to 114. Everybody deserted him up, up here. Our forefathers hang, hung on to their faith and they passed us a good product because they understood one thing. They had come through difficult times and they found salvation in the message of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. They knew that there would be no compromise when it came to matters of Sharia. Our customs and cultures would have to give way to the Sharia. A firm foundation would be the gift that they would bestow to future generations, which we inherited. Having inherited a good product, we have chosen to dilute it. And it seems everything goes now. The Sharia is being used to justify anything and everything. And the product that we will leave behind is being diluted so much that our children are getting confused. Thus, we are facing double troubles from outside forces and from within. We can fix the internal problem once we understand and accept that there will be no compromise in the matters of Sharia. Matters of Sharia will take precedence over everything. For example, just with this and I, find, I finish. How lightly do we take Salat? We have talked about Salat, so I don't want to break the, take the, uh, overdo the point. For example, Salat time is about uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. Zohar is 1.23 and Maghrib is about 8.40 at the moment. What time do I pray? 7.30 in the morning, 8, uh, 8 p.m. in the afternoon or 11 p.m. at night. Right? Just a few minutes before it is Qadha. But when it comes to business or work and my day starts at 8.30 a.m., I'm at work at 8 o'clock. It is at 5 o'clock I'm supposed to clock off. But I am there till 6 or 7 o'clock. Why? Because it is because we do not pay attention and we do not consider the matters of Sharia as important. I am more concerned about what people say about me and what instead of what Allah will ask about me. Muharram Majlis, for example, starts for say 8 o'clock. But we do not turn up until 8.30 or 9. Weddings are organized for 2 p.m. but nobody shows up till 5 o'clock. It seems that it is fashionable to, stay, to turn up late or pray late. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can wait. The Imam can wait. Bibi Fatima can wait. My boss cannot wait. This is where we find ourselves. This is where we find. Our aqidah is that when we go to a majlis, Sayyida comes. The Imam is the man, Allahu Farajahu Sharif does come. And we have the audacity to keep them waiting. 
We have the audacity to keep them waiting. We don't even think like that. We say that, yes, Ayyada is here. May Allah bless her. Yeah, if she is, her presence is there. She will come at 2 o'clock. You gave the time 2 o'clock. By 3 o'clock, you haven't started. She's already gone. Right? I mean, think about that and say, we, very, very important that we make sure. Allama Majlisi alayhi rahma in his mahasin quotes Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, when a believer dies, six figures enter his grave along with them. With this, we finish. Six figures enter his grave along with them. Out of these six, one is more illuminated, pure, and fragrant than the others. So there are six, but one of them is really, uh, with a lot of light, smells beautiful. One stands on the right-hand side. The second on the left-hand side. This is, I'm in my grave, huh? One on the right, one on the left, the third in the front, fourth near the head, fifth near the legs, and the one that is more illuminated covers on the top. From whichever side the punishment of Allah comes, the figure on that side defends the body. The one who is more illuminated asks these other figures, May Allah bless you all. Who are you? Who are you? The one on the right hand side says, I am the prayers, the salat which he recited in his lifetime. I am the salat which he recited in his lifetime. The one on the left says, I am the charity which he gave when he was alive. The one who's standing in front says, I am the uh, uh, fasting that he performed when he was alive. The one near the head says, I am the hajj and the umrah which he performed during his life. The one standing by the leg says, I am the kindness which he performed with his brother's believers. And the one, then all the faces turn towards the more illuminated one and ask him, who are you? He replies, I am the love for the Ahlu Bayt which he carried in his heart. I am the love for the Ahlul Bayt which he carried in his... Mu'mineen, we have all the na'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with us. Everything is with us. It is like as if when you have, you know, the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't realize it, you take it for granted. And only when it disappears from your hand... That's when you realize the na'mah is gone. It's just like when I am 25 years old and I still think I'm 25 years old and I look right and I look left and I say, who on earth are these guys, right? And I realize that these, my sons are even more than 25 years old. That I have aged. Now all the, the value of my young life is now realized when I'm an old man now. Why are we not losing, why are we losing sight of the fact that this rahmah, that na'mah in the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wilaya of Ali Muhammad alayhi salam is within our hearts and we are blessed with it. These are treasures. This is the gold, diamonds and the jewelry and everything else that we have with us. Let us not lose it. Let us know that on this day of uh, Eid, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and give us the tawfiq to make sure that we understand what we have is na'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to thank him for everything that he has blessed us with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq on the, to remain on the right path, to understand the message of Islam and to become good practicing Muslims, to give shafa to the uh, sick, to give maghfirah to the deceased, relieve the oppressed from the shackles of oppression, hasten the appearance of our imam, and give us the tawfiq to recognize him and to be of assistance to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you on this auspicious day and guide you, uh, guide us all. May I, I wish you all Eid Mubarak and to your families. Salawat ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala, salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabiyya ayuhal ladhina manu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد سيد المرسلين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى علي نمير المؤمنين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وفاطمة بنت محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد والحسن المجتبى اللهم صل على محمد شيء 
والحسین بشہید کربلا اللہم صلی علی محمد و آل محمد و علی ابن الحسین و محمد ابن علی و جعفر ابن محمد و موسیٰ ابن جعفر و علی ابن موسیٰ و محمد ابن علی و علی ابن محمد و الحسن ابن علی و الحجت القائم بالحق المہدی اللہم صلی علی محمد و آل محمد الذي ببقاء بقية الدنيا وبيمنه رزق الورى وبوجوده ثبذت الأرض والسماء وبه يملأ الله الأرض قسطا وعدلا كما مليت ظلما وجورا وعجل لنا اللهم ظهوره إنه يرون بعي رونه بعيدا ونراه قريبا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد